heard a scream. You've been having nightmares for weeks, sweetie. It wasn't a dream. Well, sometimes it's hard to tell. No, I heard it, Mum. You should definitely go to the cops. What would I say? Like, hello, officer, I know who the killer is. We share a hedge. What are you up to? Where's Susan Miller? I don't know why you're here. You should be next door. Who exactly do you think is in there? Police. He hunts. He captures. He tortures. He kills. I don't know what to do anymore. I just want you to believe me. We have to go in. This is not a normal teenage dilemma. Seven people are dead. There's nothing here. What was that? William, get out of there now! Mark Hartley, director of Girl at the Window. Congratulations on the film, mate, and thanks for joining us on Screen Watching. My pleasure. One of the one of the great joys of interviewing Mark Hartley is that you get to ask, quote, what were your influences? Because the answer is going to be some deep dive into I guess your love and knowledge of cinema. What were your influences on Girl at the Window? Uh I remember saying to the DOP and to also Jamie, who did the score to Gary and Jamie, that um, I always wanted this film to be like an Amblin movie if okay. Toby Hooper had directed it. Nice, yes. So it's yep. kind of, you know, a throwback to, you know, kind of a fun Nancy Drew style film that also has sort of some slightly more extreme, uh, you know, ingredients sure. that you don't expect. Yeah, well, that does come as a bit of a surprise. There are some moments in there that sort of take it out of that teen... Uh, world in which it sort of posits itself at the start. I'm glad you mentioned your DOP because I love the look of the film. You, you sort of forgo that tinny blue sheen of a lot of modern films and you've got these bold primary colours and these sort of deep shadows. Um, the reasoning behind that sort of stylistic choice, because it looks beautiful. Uh, look, Gary and I are fans of, you know, films that actually look good. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we we... Our style isn't your typical Australian style, I think, which you know, is very, very naturalistic and everything looks like it was lit with zero lights. Yeah. And, um, and we kind of, we kind of, you know, the, the problem is when you're working on very, not so much limited budgets, but limited schedules, you can only do your best. But we really tried to make this film like it look like a, an old fashioned throwback where there's not a handheld shot in the film, everything's shot on tracks and dollies and cranes and, and everything's lit to look like a Hollywood film. And it achieves that. It comes across like that. Can I throw two words at you? De Palma? Is there elements of, of Mr. Oh, sure. De Palma? Yeah, yeah. look, um, you know, the same with Patrick. I mean, we both of us love Hitchcock's acolytes. So there's a, there's a lot of De Palma in there. And there's a lot of stuff that De Palma stole from other people. I mean, all the split diopter stuff really is the, the, the masterwork of Robert Weiss. If you look at Andromeda Strain and things like that, every single shot's a, a, a diopter shot. So mm. we love the look of diopters. We love split screen, so we threw a split screen sequence in there. And, um, you know, Richard Franklin's another big influence for both of us. So, yeah, oh, certainly it, it pays homage to the people who paid homage to Hitchcock. Yeah. Um, the qualities of Ella Newton in the, in the lead role, she's sort of that, I guess, teen princess type archetype at the start, but also morphs into the strong, more adult version of herself, sort of a, a Sydney Preston from Scream type of transformation. T tell us about her casting and her qualities. Oh, look, you know, we, we, you have to um, appease sales agents when you're casting any lead these days. And sure. thankfully, I really loved Ella and so did they. And um, as soon as I saw her, her tape, uh, she was just great. Mm. And um, I think the most important thing with Ella is that you do believe that her and Rada 
a mother and daughter, which yeah. was kind of the, the most important thing for the film. But yeah, no, I mean, Ella's character is interesting because she's kind of a bookworm, like who's very, well, obviously she's retreated into another world since the death of her father, but feels like she needs to protect what's left of her family. And so, yeah, she does find that inner strength, but without having an amazing kind of like a uh, training sequence transformation, you know, it just, it just, it happens very organically. And um, I think her and Karis together are great. And if I had have known how great they would have been as best friends, we would have certainly uh, featured them in a lot more scenes together. She's, um, she brings one of the key prerequisites for the role, and that's a great set of lungs. She's quite the screamer, Ella. The scene up against the garage door. Yeah, no, she, she, is, yeah. <laughs> she gives it her all. She can scream and she can cry on cue, so you can't complain about any of those assets. She did. She pulled the tears out of that, that, that one very specific moment, which I thought was a really sort of nice touch. Good luck to her for doing that. That was great. Yeah, no, she, I mean, look, she does actually go off and work herself up to it and comes on and says, I'm ready. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it, 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 she was able to do it at just the perfect moment for that scene. Um, I want to ask you about Anthony Ganain, your producer on Girl at the Window, and someone you've had a, a working relationship with for I guess the best part of a decade, probably more than a decade now. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm sure he'll let you call him Tony. <laughs> I'll go, we'll call him Tony. Yes, I've met Anthony a couple of times and we do we do chat quite a bit when we get together, but he's, a, he's an interesting figure. What 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 does his interesting industry standing, I guess, and, and his production skill and acumen mean to you and to the industry as a whole? I think Tony must be the last of his generation still standing in terms of actively producing films. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone who was working, you know, um, uh, you know, as his peers back in the, the 70s are still actually doing it. So, you know, he's certainly been resilient. And, uh, you know, I obviously made a love letter to his films of the 70s to some degree with Not Quite Hollywood, certainly, you know, Patrick. And, um, and yeah, he, uh, Tony went in there and batted for me when no one else would. So I owe Tony a great deal. I mean, on Patrick, he, he achieved something quite amazing. And that was that, you know, he, he went out and raised finance for a genre film that had a first time DOP, first time director and first time screenwriter, you know, and, um, and once again, with this film, like uh, when everyone would have given up, he was just, you know, relentless in finding enough funds via various means to get it made. Mm. Where does Mark Hartley go with his next project? You're, you're, you're of this, I mean, I guess you're our Tarantino in many ways. You, you make movies about movies and you, and, you, and you sort of draw from this great well of knowledge you have of cinema to, to make your films. Is there a particular genre you want to go down next? Uh, look, I, you know, directors like me who uh, can't be choosy, you know, if if I could be choosy, sure, yeah, I'd love to make blah blah next. But you know, I'm at the whim of producers, unfortunately, and um, and whatever projects are brought to me or whatever ones I can can get off the ground. Um, I would, you know, in a perfect world, I really love heist movies, and I'd love to do an old fashioned heist slash oh, wow. caper film. Yeah. But you know, saying that is like saying I'd like to, you know, go in and steal the Mona Lisa. <laughs> so, yeah, cool, exactly. Nice sort of melding of analogies there. Well done. Uh, well, so, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I really, you know, I'm working on various projects. It's always the least likely project is the one that gets up, is, which is what happened with Girl at the Window. I mean, we all thought that this was the project that was dead. And it was the one that, you know, we ended up getting that phone call saying, you know, you're shooting in six weeks. Yeah. Well, wow. um, you pulled it together beautifully. It's a lot of fun. I hope it does very well for you. Um, clearly with, with international sales in mind too, this, as much as it is, as it is Australian production, this sort of has a, a quality about it that we'll see it travel, one would hope. Yeah, we've been really lucky. I mean, it had to pre-sell to actually to, for us to raise the finance. So it did pre-sell to quite a few territories. Yep. And since it's been finished and it's screened uh, in the marketplace at Cannes, it's been sold to a lot more territories. So yeah, it's... Um, it's kind of, it's interesting. It's very strange for a genre film, I think, Girl at the Window, because when you look at genre films these days, they're either really, really extreme or they're really, really arty. And there doesn't seem to be very much being made slap bang in the middle. Mm. And I think our film very much is that, you know, kind of a genre film made not necessarily for people who, who embrace genre films. I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, 
it's um it's it's going to be interesting to see how audiences react to it yeah i was I, and i'm glad you bring that up because it reminded me in throwback terms to something that curtis hansen might have done with a, a hand that rocks the cradle or a, or a bedroom window or that kind of film back from the, the 80s and 90s that it certainly fits into that mold and with all that that skill as well attached to it so congratulations mate you've made a, a really fine film and, and very, all the best with it thanks so much Sean. really appreciate it